Yeah, Limonat. The story of Laetul Qadr is the story of the Quran. It is the night of the first revelation of the Prophet Muhammad. And since the first Laylatul Qadr, the Quran has become one of the most influential texts in history, not just for Muslims, but for people around the world who look for, to it for guidance and for inspiration. Today, others are celebrating another literary work, another text. On May the 4th of every year, fans of science fiction and science fantasy celebrate Star Wars Day by watching movies and TV shows, reading books and comic books, dressing up in costumes, and even engaging with their friends. The reason that I bring it up today is not only because it is Star Wars Day, but in all of Western literature, I have not found a more comprehensive allegory for a smiley philosophy and a smiley history. Now, I can go into depth on every movie and every TV show and every book that I've read on the connections to our Ismaili history and the teachings of our Imams, but I will keep it simple for this morning and narrow my scope down to five topics. We'll start with the Force. In Star Wars, we have what is called the Force. Normally, this is presented as a sort of space magic people moving objects with their mind, reading minds, telling the future, all through this mysterious energy called the Force. The Force? The Force, the force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us, it penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. So while this Force is wielded like magic, it is actually an energy that encompasses the entire universe and holds everything together. The Force is not a power you have. It's not about lifting rocks. It's the energy between all things, the tension, the balance that binds the universe together. Okay. But what is it? Now this explanation of the Force is very, very similar to Hazrat Ali's explanation of Tawhid. Because when we say Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad in our dua, we're saying that Allah is one, but that doesn't mean that Allah is singular in a numerical sense. Uh, Malana Hazrat Ali has explained that Allah is one because everything is combined and unified into one, and that makes Allah, right? So when we look at the force in Star Wars as binding the universe together, in much the same way as Hazrat Ali describes, Allah binds the universe together, uniting it and making the entire universe one. But how does the force pro proliferate through the universe? In the Star Wars canon, they have the wellspring of life. The wellspring of life is a planet where the force comes from, and through that planet, it spreads throughout the galaxy. Now, wellspring is a very interesting word to use because a smiley scholar, Abu Yaqub al Sijistani, has also published a treatise entitled Wellsprings, where he describes four wellsprings through which the universal soul, or Allah, proliferates through our lives and through our universe. Okay. These four wellsprings are the intellect, the soul, the prophet, and the imam, which we'll get into a little bit more detail later. But it's through these minute sources, these pinpoints in the universe, that the entirety of God's grace and God's mercy can spread throughout the entire universe. As we heard in Asula then earlier tonight, or earlier this morning, our goal is to seek oneness with Allah, to seek fanna fillah, right? In the Star Wars TV show, one of the main characters travels to this wellspring of life and seeks to become one with the Force through meditation, through self-exploration, through defeating the darker parts of himself, he is able to transcend and become one with the universe, just as we all seek to do 
in our spiritual lives, in our physical lives, and through our bandhi. Next, I will talk about the Jedi. The Jedi are the main characters of Star Wars. They are the ones that use the Force. They wear these long flowy robes, they carry swords, laser swords, and they go out on their adventures and help fight for the universe. For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the old Republic. Before the dark times, before the Empire. The Jedi come from a planet called Jeddah, which is a desert planet with a holy city that is often frequented by pilgrims. Later on in the series, they do have a terrorist problem. If that sounds familiar, Muslims are also from a desert, which contains a Jeddah city, and from a city that had frequent pilgrimages and now has a bit of a terrorist problem. But the Jedi also go through a rigorous amount of training. They're found and taken from their families when they are children, and they are trained night and day by the Jedi masters, and they know nothing other than the Jedi temple until they are ready to go out and fulfill their duty. And we have a historical citation or a historical description of the Fidai from James Vitry, who was the Archbishop of, of Acre in the 13th century. He said, the old man, their Lord referring to Hassan ben Saba, causes the boys of his people to be brought up in secret and delightful places. And having had them diligently trained and instructed in the different kinds of languages, sends them to various provinces with daggers and orders them to slay the great men of the Christians as well as the Saracens. So we can see this parallel as well between the Jedi and the Fidai, where children are brought into the temple, trained in the arts, and then sent out to commit violence. Now, of course, Farhad Daftari in his book, Assassin's Legends, has quoted this passage from James Vitry and cited that it has no historical backing to it. It is an absolutely false statement, even though it was a popular story uh, spread around Europe. But we can also look to an example from Mulana Hazar Imam. In my previous presentation, I mentioned the Lashkar. Lashkar are those who participate in Beit al Khayal. That term was used by Mulana Hazar Imam up until I believe 1972, perhaps a little bit later. And of course, Lashkar translates to soldiers. So during this time um, in the 60s and 70s, Lashkar were, was a term used to describe Ismaili children who are brought in to Jumat Khana, trained um, to be spiritual children of the Imam, trained to the highest level and then given the rank of being able to join Beit al-Khayal and receiving the Isma Azam, just like the Jedi are trained as children before they are promoted to actually commit their duties. Next, I'm going to talk about the Sith. The Sith are the bad guys in the Star Wars universe. They also have this connection to the Force, to the universal intellect. The difference between the Sith and the Jedi is that the Sith have a stronger connection to the Force. They have a more powerful connection to the Force. Um, the reason that they have this connection is because they are greedy and they fought for it. But we also have people in our own lives that have this stronger connection to Allah. The Sith follow what is known as the rule of twos. There are only allowed to be two at any given time, a master and an apprentice. But from the ashes of destruction, I was the last survivor. I chose to pass my knowledge on to only one. I created a legacy so resilient that now you come before me. <laughs> so if you look back at the words of Abu Yaqub's al-Sijistani, he says that Ali was the founder and his function was to institute the living Zawil without which the law of Muhammad, despite its perfection, was likely to become useless. While Muhammad was himself a founder, it was Ali who provided this role within its specific meaning and form. What Abu Yaqub al-Sajistani is describing is that throughout prophethood and imama, throughout our history, there has been a master and an apprentice when it comes to delivering the message of Allah, right? We have the prophet, who receives the message from Allah and begins the delivery. 
And then we have an Imam who interprets the message and continues the delivery after the Prophet passes away. This was the case for Prophet Muhammad and Hazrat Ali. It was the case for Prophet Moses and Hazrat Aaron. It was the case for Prophet Ibrahim and Ismail and Isaac as well. So we have the person who gets the information and begins the delivery, and we have the person who interprets the information and then continues the delivery after the death of the first. Just like in the Sith, once the apprentice is strong enough, the master dies and the apprentice takes over. We also see this in the relationship between the Imams and the peers. The Imams provide the message and then the peers interpret the message for the specific Jamaat. Always two there are, no more, no less. A master and an apprentice. When Mulana Hazar Imam was appointed as the Imam, he was also appointed as the peer. And this coincides with the latest Star Wars movie, when this dynamic, this rule of two between the Sith were collapsed into a single person. You are nothing. A scavenger girl is no match for the power in me. I am all the Sith. Just as Mulan Hazri Imam embodies both the Imam and the peer today. We also have this notion of peace and balance. Right? So the force, this spiritual energy in the Star Wars universe isn't good or bad. It isn't powerful or weak, but it is the balance between extremes. Right? If you remember my talk from last Leto Qadr, we spoke about the importance of balance. We spoke about the importance of moderation and how that can lead to spiritual fulfillment. And they have the same notion here between balance. So this is a quote from the Aga Khan Development Network Ethical Framework, which has a whole section on Din and Dunya. And it says, for the truly discerning, the earthly life, Dunya, is a gift to cherish in as much as it is a bridge to and preparation for the life to come. Otherwise, it is enticement, distracting men from service of God, which is not the true purpose of life. Service of God is not only worship, but also service to humanity and abiding by the duty of trust towards the rest of creation. Righteousness, says the Quran, is not only fulfilling one's religious obligations, without social responsibility, religiosity is a show of conceit. And in Star Wars, we have this constant battle between the good of the universe and the evil of the universe. It's only in the show Rebels that we're introduced to a character who sits firmly in the middle of this good and even, of this good and evil, purely as a moderator. And he is able to arbitrate this war between good and evil because he has the balance. And likewise, in our own lives, we should seek this balance and not go too far one way or too far the other. And finally, we have meditation. Meditation is a constant theme in Star Wars. The Jedi practice meditation, and those who are not Jedi but still believe in the Force practice meditation all the time. Sometimes they practice it while they're safe in their temple and they're contemplating their own choices and the consequences of their actions. Sometimes they meditate like Qui-Gon Jinn in Episode 1 in the heat of battle while blades are pointing at them and they find the time to meditate. Likewise, we should also find time to meditate and time to pray, not just when we need help, but when we are also, you know, at relative ease. Okay. So with that in mind, we need to understand that prayer is not just for difficult times, but it's also for easy times. It's also to gain clarity. It's also just to thank Allah for what we have. It needs to be a part of our everyday lives. But why am I talking about Star Wars at all, right? This is a prayer circle, this is Leto Qadr, why am I talking about science fiction movies? One of the defining characteristics that we have as humans and especially as Muslims is literature. Literature gives us a chance to express what we believe to be the truth of the world in an exaggerated way. And Star Wars is what the creators believed to be the truth of the world, that things are all interconnected, that things succeed in moderation, that meditation should be a part of our life, 
and they're displaying it in this symbolic, metaphorical way. In really dark times, it's often faith that uh, sustains people. So if we're going to take the force out of this movie, there would have to be this question of whether anyone is ever going to believe in it again and whether it mattered at all. We understood that for people who don't have physical evidence of magic or their religion in the universe, you find it uh, in, in other people and in what you're willing to do for them and what they're willing to do. So it's not just Star Wars. If you haven't seen Star Wars, that's fine. But if you want to learn more about Ismailism, I encourage you to watch it. But any book that you read, any TV show that you watch, any movie that you watch, any literature that you engage with, you should always be asking, what does this piece of literature say about the world that I live in? What can I learn about my own life from this piece of literature? Because that's how we share truths with each other.